welcome back. I hope you've had uh, great breaks and are feeling restored and have had a good beginning to our spring term. Uh, thank you all for coming in yesterday to get tested and I hope those results are appropriately supportive of us and our mission. Central to Roxbury Latin's mission and tradition is tending to the spiritual growth of our boys. The spiritual life can take many forms, a communion with nature, a foundation in organized religion, a commitment to service, a journey towards strong moral character. We hear frequently from speakers throughout the year about topics of faith, spirituality, and living with purpose. In October, during the High Holy Days of the Jewish calendar, we heard from Daniel Burke and Heshi Leibowitz about the traditions of Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. We heard this fall from Mansur Shams about his experience of living both as a practicing Muslim and a US Marine. And during the celebration of Diwali in November, we heard from Swami Tayagananda of the Hindu faith about the spiritual victory of light over darkness and virtues to which we can all aspire. This past weekend, Jews began their celebration of Passover. And this week, Christians look forward to the culmination of the most important period of their liturgical calendar, Holy Week, which began on Palm Sunday and will conclude this coming Sunday with the celebration of Easter. During the roughly 40 days of Lent, which precedes Holy Week, Christians are called to reflect, to account for themselves, and to give alms. During Lent, it is commonplace for people to give something up, to sacrifice, or to offer devotions and prayers. This preparation is seen as a worthy exercise as the faithful move toward becoming more reflective, more generous, more perfect human beings. And now we come to the end of that 40-day penitential season, Holy Week. Much more than Christmas, the Christian holiday that has been secularized and distorted, the next four days commemorate the essence of Christian beliefs. Today is Holy Thursday, tomorrow Good Friday, the day on which Jesus was crucified, the most solemn day of the Christian calendar, followed by Holy Saturday and then Easter, when Christians believe Jesus was resurrected. Here with us this morning to share his personal reflections on the meaning of Holy Thursday in particular and how the lessons relate to each of us, regardless of our faith or beliefs is Roxbury Latin parent and trustee, Jim Frades. Mr. Frades is the chief financial officer of Amelix Pharmaceuticals, a company focused on developing new treatments for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, Alzheimer's disease, and other neurodegenerative diseases. Prior to this new role, Mr. Frades was the CFO of Alkermaze, a global biopharmaceutical company with a focus on nervous system diseases for 22 years. Upon his appointment at Amelix in January, Mr. Frady said the following. Since my cousin Pete Frady's was diagnosed with ALS in 2012, and through his extraordinary work with the Ice Bucket Challenge, I have felt a calling to become more involved in the fight to find more effective treatments. I am eager to join Amelix because it has made so much progress against neurodegenerative diseases, and I believe my experience can help the company scale and deliver on its promise of creating a medicine that can help delay neurodegeneration in patients. The opportunity to help fight ALS means a great deal to me and my family. Mr. Frades' career has included working in healthcare investment banking and even spending a year teaching secondary school at the Royal Shrewsbury School in the UK as the Harvard College Fellow. In addition to serving as treasurer of Roxbury Latin's Board of Trustees, Mr. Frades serves on the boards of Sage Therapeutics and St. Francis House and formerly on the board of his alma mater, St. Paul's School in New Hampshire. He earned his bachelor's degree in government and his MBA from Harvard. And most important, he's the proud father of two RL boys, John, class of 2019, and of course, Peter in class one. Would you help me to welcome to hall this morning, Mr. Jim Frades. Thank you, Carrie, uh, for that kind introduction. And, and thank you all for your attention this morning. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I wanna start this morning with, with mocha, not chocolate, cafe latte, or the like, no. Mocha is a word that you'll know when you get older. It's the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test. It's used in folks when they have memory problems and as a way to track their decline over time. It has six or seven parts. You have to recognize a picture of animals like a lion or a giraffe. Uh, you have to draw the hands of a clock at a certain time. And you have to remember three or four words given to you at the beginning of the session with the doctor. The words for today are pineapple, seagull, and grail. And I'll be back to those in a minute. I started with the MOCA because I have the privilege to work for a company that's trying to discover a treatment for some terrible neurodegenerative disorders, ALS, Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia. We don't really know what causes these diseases, 
and there's no real effective treatments. The company I work for was actually started by two young men eight years ago in their dorm room at Brown. They had a pretty interesting idea. They combined two naturally occurring compounds, one from the bile acid found in bears' stomachs, the other, a short chain fatty acid called butyrate that is the product of the little microbes that populate our human intestines. They learned that together these compounds have a synergistic effect and keep neurons alive longer when they're faced with oxidative cell damage. Scraping together money in the beginning, they started out by testing the compounds in test tubes, then animals. And then last year, they reported a successful study in 150 participants suffering from ALS. The drug slowed the decline of the disease and helped patients live an average of six months longer. Now we have to repeat that study to confirm it wasn't just chance for the United States approval. But in the meantime, Canadian and European regulators have invited us to seek approval for the drug. I work on the finances and the operations in concert with engineers who make the drug and doctors who design the double blind randomized prospective clinical studies that will prove its effectiveness. As we work, of course, patients with ALS and Alzheimer's slowly decline and hope for a cure. These patients provide a powerful motivation. But back to my three words this morning. How's everyone's cognitive function this early? What were the three words? I'll remind you, pineapple, seagull, and grail. These words are for our abbreviated MOCA experiment, but I think they're worth remembering for the long-term as well. I hope you remember what they represent and the lessons they hold in life. First word, pineapple, the symbol of wealth, hospitality, exotic and distant shores. Imagine 100 years ago how rare they were. Well, without an RL alumni, we probably wouldn't know them at all. The story of James Drummond Dole from the class of 1895. Drummond set out across the world to Hawaii to make his fortune after hearing stories from his cousin who was a missionary. Dole was a gardener and imagine how wonderful the climate and sun in Hawaii must have sounded. Land, opportunity, sunshine, dreams. Off he went as soon as he finished college. He started to grow coffee, but he learned the hard way that it doesn't grow well in the Hawaiian soils. He failed in a number of business adventures, in fact. Not every paradise is as wonderful as it seems from a distance. He did not, however, give up. He started to focus, of all things, on pineapples. People thought he was crazy, but he slowly built a business using trial and error. Interestingly, he had key support from his RL friends. They kept him in business and provided funding at critical times that allowed his last ditch idea to succeed. Things really work out without some failure along the way. They really work out without some help or trust of others. For Dole, the many challenges were overcome, uh, uh, there, were, there were to overcome before he had success. His leadership proved critical. He organized farmers to advertise together. He invented and perfected growing techniques. He hybridized new variants and created canning machines and shipping containers. He had a vision. It was an amazing story recounted uh, by Tony Jarvis in his book, The Men of Roxbury. Importantly, he also took care of his people, from farmers to partners. They thrived under his leadership and they stuck with him. An interesting aside, the company was only named after him by subsequent owners. He didn't name the, cap the company after himself. I like that modesty. On to our second word, seagull. This is the story of Captain Eddie Rickenbacker. He was a hard scrabble young man. His father died at 14. He had to work eight jobs in two years before settling in as a mechanic in a recently started automobile company. In the early 1900s, when, when Eddie was young, automobiles were a new industry. Fast moving and a growing technology, he learned how to fix and diagnose engines. His curiosity drove him and soon he was an expert in engines in a small company. One thing led to another and soon he was brought in to fix engines on a race car circuit and his persistence led him to become a driver. He had found a calling. He became the leading race car driver of his age and had success and great fame. World War II came along and he was drawn to the cause and found his way onto General Pershing's staff first as a driver. Once he got to France, he started flying another frontier to conquer. Rickenbacker soon became the greatest ace in American history. He was said to be the most decorated American in World War I. 
After the war, he continued to have success. He started a car company on his own. He actually bought the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and he was involved in the founding and running of Eastern Airlines. He even authored a famous comic strip. He might have been one of the most interesting men in the world. But why Seagulls? Well, in the midst of all his success, it was almost all lost. It was in 1942 during World War II, and Captain Rickenbacker was sent on a mission to inspect and improve air stations in the South Pacific. Poor navigation left the plane he was traveling on lost in the Pacific. Imagine what we take for granted. You don't wanna take a wrong turn flying over the Pacific Ocean without GPS, and in the middle of a war, no less. The next part of this story comes from a sermon my uncle, a Navy priest and former World War II pilot in the Pacific used to give during Lent. I'm not sure if the story was passed on from pilots or if it came from Rickenbacker's autobiography, which you see here, aptly entitled Rickenbacker, but it speaks to the power of prayer, even to a powerful man like Rickenbacker. I'll quote my uncle's sermon now. They had to ditch the plane in the ocean. Captain Rickenbacker and six crew members spent 21 days adrift. After exhausting their supplies, starving, and near the point of death, Captain Rickenbacker organized a prayer meeting. And he said, Master, we're in an awful fix, as you know. We're counting on a little something by day after tomorrow at the latest. Rickenbacker then lay on his back and pulled his hat down over his face. At that point, something landed on him, a seagull. He slowly reached up and captured the gull and then divided it among his men. The remainder provided him with bait for two fish, which were quickly captured. There were no skeptics about God among those men. A few days later, at the point of dehydration, Rickenbacker prayed again, Master, we call on you for food and you delivered. We now ask you for water. If you don't make up your mind and help us soon, I guess that'll all there'll be to it. The next move is up to you. Later that evening, a, squ a squall occurred providing the men with enough water to survive until their rescue. These are two themes in these two stories about leadership, I think. Who steps up? Who leads? When and how? Do you lead for good? Do you leave the world a better place? The power of a single personality when working for good can have an enormous impact. We all have chances to lead in life. Don't be afraid to take them. The people around you are depending on you. My final word this morning is grail. You'll probably know that word either from the story of King Arthur or from Monty Python's more modern version, which includes my favorite scene in movies when John Cleese leaning over the castle walls uh, and shouting in his false faux French accent when asked about the grail. And he says, we've already got one. But the grail in literature and in real life represents salvation, eternal life, fellowship, peace. It was literally the cup that Jesus used in his final meals with his friends and apostles before his death. As Mr. Brennan referred to, Holy Thursday is all about that, but more. Holy Thursday or Maundy Thursday is an important dimension in this Holy Week for Christians. You'll know about Easter, of course, when Christians believe Christ rose from the dead. Good Friday will also be well known and understood, uh, the day when Christ was crucified. But Marking Holy Thursday is important. And in the Episcopal tradition, we call it Maundy Thursday. And it's the day that sets up and highlights all that is to follow. As in most human events, there's always a lead up, a series of telling events before the denouement. And as I reflected on what to speak to you about this morning, the day and its lessons became even more clear for me. The Last Supper was where I started, where most people I think start and think about when they think of Holy Thursday. This is the day when Christ held his Last Supper, this representation here of the Eucharist, the famous picture by Leonardo, comes to mind as one of our greatest masterpieces. Of course, there's the betrayal of Judas, who's to Christ's right or to the left in our picture as we look at him. Um, and uh, a lot happens here. But there are, however, two other very important events worth recalling on this day. The first happened before the meal, when Christ washes the feet of his disciples. This is where the word mondi comes from from the Latin mandatum, to command. It recalls Jesus's command to his disciples to love one another as I have loved you. This fellowship and caring for one's friends and neighbors. This is a revolutionary idea, particularly at the time, that uh, 
uh, that leadership through service is worth remembering. Christ washed the feet of his friends and his followers. The message is clear. If you want to lead, you must serve. If you want to truly lead, you must care for one another. Finally, there's the scene in the garden at Gethsemane, the so-called agony in the garden where Jesus takes his three closest apostles and friends, Peter, John, and James, and asks them to sit with him as he prays. Jesus knows what's coming. He's afraid. He prays and his friends fall asleep. They fail him. They'll have redemption later, but at that crucial moment, they fail their friend and their leader. These three great events are the events Christians remember on Maundy Thursday. The command of service, the remembrance of Jesus and the fellowship of the Last Supper, and the agony in the garden, where we see even his devoted friends and followers sometimes fall short. So back to these three words. Will you pass your mocha this morning? Pineapple, seagull, and grail. I hope you'll remember these words and your days at RL as you go through life. The pineapple, learn from Mr. Dole. Dream big, don't give up. Look to your friends for support. Be a friend and take care of each other and those around you. The seagull, learn from Captain Rickenbacker. One of the most well-known and successful men of his era, he almost died with a terrible mistake. Work hard, find your passion, give all you can, make the pie bigger, but remember it can change at any moment. But even then, step up in times of trouble and be a leader and don't be afraid to pray. Finally, the grail and all the depth of what happened on Monday Thursday. Remember the greatest commandment of all that came from Jesus, love one another as I have loved you, Lead by serving others with humility and know that even if you fail, you'll always have a chance to succeed at another task and redeem yourself. I'm sure you hear this a lot, but you've been given a great gift. Your community here at Roxbury Latin is a very special one. Your fellowship, your classmates, your teachers, remember your friends, carry it forward. Don't be afraid to lead and don't be afraid to rely on your friends. And again, I wouldn't be shy about praying. Thank you for your attention this morning. I wish you all a successful and memorable spring term. And I'll leave you with one of my favorite quotes of mine, a quote that my father kept on his desk. It's from Oliver Wendell Holmes, a famous 19th century Boston physician and poet. And it goes as follows. I find the great thing is not so much where we stand as in what direction we're moving. To reach the port of heaven, we must sail sometimes with the wind and sometimes against it, but we must sail and not drift, nor lie at anchor. Thank you very much. Mr. Frades, thank you so much. Um, I just would remind if you, if anyone has questions for Mr. Frades, you can put those in the Q&A. Um, and I have one question from a faculty member to start us off with here. Um, the question is, uh, in your, to your mind, what role does faith play in sustaining us in life and where is it important? Oh, wow. That's uh, that's a deep question that I, I I'll, uh, many other, you know, thinkers from, uh, I guess, you know, St. Augustine all the way through to, to smart scholars today, we'll talk about that. Um, for me, it, it comes down to helping find a guide and a path in life. Um, <clears throat> and it's interesting, I always thought in my faith, you know, growing up, uh, that, that, it would be a clear path, a clear signal, and there'd be kind of this aha moment that you might see in the movies, uh, or even, you know, Monty Python comes to mind again, you know, the light shining down and, and telling you in which direction to go, but I've actually found faith myself in, um, in those friends and fellowships that I talked about in the talk, and I feel very strongly that, at least for me, uh, I feel like God has put friends and experiences in front of me that help shape uh, the way I go through life. Um, and, you know, part of that was with, uh, as Mr. Brennan mentioned, you know, the experience my cousin had with ALS and then, you know, bumping into these young men that founded this company, it just felt very, very much like a calling for me to, to go help in the, in the search for a new drug for ALS. Um, but it's, it's meeting those friends along the way for me and having trust a little bit in, in your instincts, um, and what you're meant to do in the world, because I, I feel very strongly that we all have a certain purpose. Uh, God's given us talents and experiences 
that only we individuals have. And it's our opportunity to shape that into something for good uh, in life. So that, that's, that's a little bit how I see faith um, and how it plays into my life. Thank you. Um, I have another question from a faculty member here. Um, and the question is, if people would want to know more about religions, what would you recommend? Oh, that, that's an interesting um, um, question. Uh, you know, of course, I, I'd say there are, are many books about faith. Um, you know, uh, one can get very uh, focused on individual faith traditions. Um, you know, but I think there are also stories. I, I think Actually, interestingly, the autobiography of Eddie Rickenbacker is a really interesting place to start. It's a, it's a fast paced story. There's a lot of different things and, and parts of the story I didn't realize. Um, you know, I realized as I was talking this morning too that many of the people in the audience might not have ever been on Eastern Airlines. Um, and I, I'm not sure what airline it's part of now, but it was one of the first airlines that it came about. And for instance, it was the first one to start the shuttle back and forth to New York, you know, which is now part of U.S. Airways, which I guess is part of United, um, but Eastern was one of the uh, uh, first airlines that that really came into business with Transworld Airlines or TWA. But I think Eddie Rickenbacker is a great story because he talks a lot about prayer um, and a lot about how his faith came to be. Um, I've also read recently. This is one of the blessings of COVID. Actually, I started to read on tape as I exercise, uh, which has taken the place of my commute back and forth. So. Trying to find time to read is something that that has been a great thing in the last year. Another book is, uh, I think it's called The Book of Joy, and it's written by Archbishop Desmond Tutu, an Episcopal Bishop of South Africa, who would be well known in his fight against apartheid there, but also he's written in concert with uh, the Dalai Lama. Um, and I think that meeting of two different faiths gives you a sense of, back to that first question, how does faith come into life? What's really important in life? Uh, to spend time on and how we spend our life. Um, and then the last thing I might mention is a wonderful speech, again, can be found pretty easily on the internet by a former uh, business school professor of mine named Clay Christensen. Um, and it's essentially how to lead a good life. Uh, and he reflects on it first at a graduation speech for Harvard Business School, and then um, he turned it into a book and a, a, even a podcast. So you can find different parts of it. Um, but it's a really nice reflection by him through the eyes of his Mormon faith and what was important to him. Um, so there's, you know, the other thing I, I would I would finally recommend maybe is, you know, talking to friends, uh, maybe friends with maybe teachers, maybe friends with older experiences, maybe uh, people that you know in, in, in your families uh, and ask them to reflect on faith. I think this is actually a wonderful thing to do with, with maybe, you know, folks from maybe the grandparents of the boys um, or our parents, maybe of, of the faculty age, or if you're lucky, still your grandparents, if, if you're a faculty member. But um, I think, too, at the end of life, we have we start to have different reflections uh, on our faith and what it means to carry through us as, as, as we grow. So hopefully, those are some good perspectives. Thank you, Mr. Freedies. Um, I have another question here. Um, so you you walked us through Dole's and um, and Rickenbacker's sort of. Um, events in their later life as adults and, and sort of what came to be. Um, in those readings, do you have any indications of what those gentlemen were like as young people, as boys? Were there early signs that, uh, that indicated some of the traits that would help them sort of arrive where they did and, and um, succeed where they did? Yeah, and, and well, and I, I, uh, I think you picked that up in both of the uh, stories, you know, that I read as I did a little bit of research, you know, both stories were kind of in the back of my mind, but as I thought about uh, the talk this morning, um, I, I ended up reading a little bit more about each of them. And, and you know, again, that, that's the great thing about the internet. There's a lot of uh, sources that are, that are easily found. Um, I think the, uh, uh, something that picks up for me is, was, I, and I kind of briefly mentioned it, was Dole's interest in gardening. You know, as a young man, I, I, I gather he spent a lot of time at his family's summer home in Maine, and he was always poking around in the garden. And, and, and that's, a, uh, that's something I know very well, um, because I was, I'll say, forced to help my father every weekend before having to go off and, you know, whether it was playing a soccer game or, you know, just going off with your friends. There was sort of the dutiful time in the garden where you had to help uh, uh, earn, your, earn your free time, I gather, in the afternoons. Um, and I always thought it was torture. 
Um, you know, but now you'll find me poking around in the garden uh, for enjoyment as, 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 a, as an older person um, and bringing back that time I spent with my father. So Dole was certainly um, interested there. And I think, you know, as a gardener, I've learned, um, you know, this is a story I remember too from Peter Gomes, who was a former trustee and friend of mine and teacher of mine in college. Uh, he always used to say, I guess he was accused of pulling up the carrots when they were young to wanting to see how they were doing, you know, as they were growing and his father would get, you know, a little angry with young Peter as he pulled the carrots up out of the, uh, too early because obviously they need time to grow and you can't be checking on the carrots. And, and I think gardening gives you a wonderful um, view to the world, uh, you know, the, the life and death that is just around the corner from, from uh, either accidents of, you know, too much wind or uh, animals coming along. And, and it's a hard job to, to make it as a farmer. Um, and I think it, it requires a little stick to itiveness, um, you know, a little ingenuity. You learn from your mistakes and, you know, you don't make them a second time. Um, and I, I, I sort of always have thought that that must have had something to do with Dole's, you know, later success. Um, and I think Rickenbacker, you know, uh, uh, my conclusion would be that, um, you know, necessity is the mother or parent of invention, as, as, as the old saying goes. And, um, you know, needing to make his way in the world as an independent young man, you know, that idea of having eight jobs in two years to try and put food on the table in the early 1900s before World War I, um, you know, is a challenge that, that uh, uh, certainly must shape you in life and your stick to um, But with both men though, they, they, they had this connection with their, with their employees, with their companies. I think they found it very much an extension of themselves. Um, and it wasn't all about uh, the enrichment that they created, um, but it, I think it really was about making sure the community thrived around them. And um, I'm sure that came from experiences they had as young men. Mr. Frades, thank you so much for being with us here this morning. Um, and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Brennan to send us off here. You're very welcome, thank, thank you. you. Mr. Frades, thank you. Uh, I, I was struck by the image in the Garden of Gethsemane of, of, of Jesus with Peter, James, and John. And so too have you gathered those three in your own family and um, al al allowed you to give witness uh, to your own faith and to, to keep us wide awake to the possibilities for, in fact, uh, discovering our own faiths and pursuing that. I hope that Christians in particular this weekend, but all others will pay attention to, to these particular important holidays in the Christian calendar and and think about what they mean and how they, they might actually inform the lives that they lead. But for your example, and obviously for your good witness this morning, I'm very grateful. Thanks so much. Thank you.